Simon Cameron, the first Lord of the Star League, was dead. While we may celebrate the Star League as our cultural epoch and lament its downfall, just how much of a fabled utopia was it really? Like all things sold on the basis of purity, it was lacking, and in time, engineered its own destruction. The fall of the Star League was nothing short of a catastrophe, a catalyst that will change the inner sphere irrevocably. It was the end of Terran imperialism, the end of Pax Tarana, and the beginning of unbridled greed, chaos, and destruction. The death of the First Lord, Simon Cameron, is one of the great mysteries of the Inner Sphere. Everyone knows the circumstances of his death were indeed suspicious, but just who perpetrated the crime will likely never be uncovered. Most people now assume it was the leader of the Rimworld's Republic who orchestrated the events that led to the ascension of his son Richard Cameron, but we cannot discount the possibility of the other great houses having a hand in the events on Star's End or even members of House Cameron itself. Many stood to gain power and influence with the removal of the First Lord, and so the debate of who was responsible will likely continue for centuries more to come. When First Lord Simon Cameron was killed on New Silesia in February 2751, it pushed the Star League, which was already teetering on a knife edge, down into the abyss. Even today, over 250 years removed from the incident, people still debate on who was to blame for what happened. Certainly we can point to who gained the most, but it would be presumptuous to declare that it was definitely them who had masterminded the assassination. Opinion is divided, but there are several likely candidates. A common belief at the time was that it was anti-Star League extremists from the Periphery Freedom Movement, likely hailing from the Tordi and Concordat. Another theory was that he was murdered by a mining consortium after he was rumoured to be giving an endorsement to Zero-G robotic asteroid excavation, potentially costing traditional planet-based mines trillions of sea bills in revenue. Few believe that the Rimwell's Republic was behind the attack, as they were, on the surface, the most loyal of the Periphery nations, being the only one that had not tolerated the PFM and so stood little to gain from the attack. History would soon prove that last part wrong, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the Amaris family was responsible. How Steiner had been embarrassed by the First Lord's peace tour through their realm, 
and his efforts to sidestep the Lyran nobility while talking directly to the common people. Still, the Archon had a reasonably positive rapport with Simon, and seems unlikely to have given such a vindictive order. The most probable candidate, and certainly one with the means to perform such a task, is House Curita. 150 years of escalating tension between the two had made it almost inevitable that something extreme was going to happen. As a nation that historically keeps a very firm control over their population, and also being Simon Cameron's next destination in his tour, it's indeed possible that they chose to eliminate him ahead of time. Ultimately though, the Draconis Combine has never claimed responsibility despite centuries of open aggression since, so we will likely never know for certain. To understand why events unfolded the way they did over the next 15 years, we first need to understand the individuals who comprised the ruling High Council, whose decisions would shape the final chapter of the Star League. If you were to compare them to the idealistic and largely principled heads of state at the founding of the Star League, it's no wonder that it all ultimately fell apart. The most senior among them was coordinator Takiro Kirita of the Draconis Combine. Like his predecessors Sirowen and Urizen II, he was blessed with a long life, and was over a hundred years old by this point. His attitude remained strongly anti-Star League following his defeat during the War of Davian Succession. Their longtime rivals, the Federated Sons, was now ruled by First Prince John Davian, who had inherited a realm in the process of moving away from its dependency on the League. While he was one of the less contentious among the Council Lords, he was of the opinion that the League was only useful if it directly benefited his own realm. Their periphery neighbour, the Outworlds Alliance, was ruled by the puritanical President Beatrice Avalar, whose beliefs often made her distant or difficult to deal with. On the opposite side of the Federated Sons, Protector Nicoletta Calderon hunted for any opportunity that might allow the Taurian Concordat to break away. Werex Liao was the last of the so-called Sunderman Liaos, and was a cautious and somewhat surly ruler for the Capellan Confederation. Venura Centrella had never settled into her role as the Magistrix of Canopus, and had a reputation for stubbornness and poor political appointments. The most abrasive man on the council was Captain General Ewan Marek of the Free Worlds League, whose brash and offensive manner made him the bane of just about everyone unfortunate enough to encounter him. He was no more popular within his own realm, his son Kenyon being a rallying point for the opposition. Were it not for the fact that no one wanted to see a repeat of the civil war just passed, then Ewan might have been forced out. Michael Steiner II, Archon of the Lyran Commonwealth, had to endure more than most when it came to Ewan's outbursts, mostly for his behaving like a military fop. The Terran hegemony would continue in the capable hands of Director General and President of the Terran Congress, Jens Pinera. Lastly, but certainly not least, was the man who would go on to define the final 30 years of the Star League, President of the Rimworld's Republic, Stefan Amaris. It was his delight to confound the others on whether he was pro or anti Star League, the true answer to which would become horrifyingly clear before the end of the next decade. This was the nest of vipers that the young Richard Cameron fell into when his father died. On April 3rd, 2751, he was confirmed in his position as First Lord of the Star League, but on account of being only eight years old, a regent would be elected to rule in his stead. In a rare moment of agreement, the Council Lords chose as regent the Commanding General of the Star League Defence Force, Alexander Kerensky. Of all the great military generals, none are as revered as Alexander Kerensky of the Star League Defence Force. His influence altered the course of human history in uncountable ways and spared our civilization from terrible atrocities. Though deified in later centuries, like many celebrated wartime leaders, his talent for peacetime statecraft was somewhat lacking, creating opportunities that others around him were quick to exploit. Kerensky had first made a name for himself during the tail end of the First Hidden War as one of the SLDF's gunslingers. From there, he went on to distinguish himself further during the Second Hidden War through his participation in Operation Smother. Many of those who served alongside him now held positions of high command. With the exception of the Archon, who had met a young Alexander studying history at Tharkad University, he first came to the attention of the Council Lords as a troublemaker out in the Concordat, who was fighting against the member state-backed economic corruption that was rife at that point in time. To remove the annoyance, the High Council promoted him to a staff position on Terra, and from there up to his predecessor's aid. After her retirement in 2739, he was a natural choice to take over as commanding general, leading the Star League military through the Third Hidden War. The fact that the Council Lords chose someone so decorated and morally upstanding, while simultaneously being beyond their control as the head of the independent SLDF, might at first seem surprising, but it was this last point in particular that made him so appealing. 
Upon hearing the news, Kerensky naturally went to resign as commanding general, but was talked into retaining his post as it was deemed he was irreplaceable at that time of growing periphery tension. There was a definite element of truth to that, as he had spent his years in command trimming the fat within the SLDF, and there was really no one who knew the inner workings of the armed forces as well as he did. Nevertheless, Alexander found it near impossible to perform both his new duties as protector of the realm and his prior role within the military. This left the actual governance of the Star League to the remaining council lords. They wasted little time before pushing through legislation that any prior first lord would never have stood for. In 2752, the High Council passed an amendment to the Council Edict of 2650, effectively removing the restraints that had limited the overall size of the individual house militaries. And to pay for this expansion in arms, they introduced new taxes aimed at the territorial states, who would foot the bill but see none of the benefits. Surviving documents from the era give us a rare insight into the comparative strength of the various house militaries in the year 2750. If we look first at the situation pre-reunification war in 2575, and contrast it to how things were post-war at the turn of the century, the most obvious change is the devastated periphery armies and navies. The three belligerent members of the ISP were never allowed to increase the size of their armed forces following this conflict. The Rimwell's Republic's sudden expansion a century prior had inadvertently caused a rebalance of power across the League. Though they only had to disband a handful of their new units, still retaining a larger RWA than they had started with, Directive 30 had the most dramatic effect on the Inner Sphere Great Houses. A hundred years later, even the illegal increase seen during the Third Hidden War had not significantly impacted their numbers. Since then, the RWA, now under the command of General Jasmine Amaris, had negotiated for an even larger military. What perhaps slipped the minds of the Council Lords when they repealed Directive 30 was that the Rimwells too now had free reign to expand their arsenal, though this seemed of little concern at the time. The SLDF had expanded steadily ever since its inception, and in 2752 outnumbered all of them put together. It was an advantage that they wouldn't maintain for very much longer. Between 2750 and 2765, the size of the House militaries effectively doubled. The biggest gains were made by the Draconis Combine mustard soldiery, the Free Worlds League military, which had been the strongest of the member states, saw its advantage slip away as they produced the fewest numbers of new mechs. It's worth noting that the battle mech forces were one of the things most tightly restricted by the Council Edict of 2650. The disparity between the SLDF and the rest of the Inner Sphere at first seems enormous, but each member state was fielding as many as a thousand conventional regiments for every 100 mech units, whereas the SLDF was split between mechs and conventional troops on a roughly 40-60 distribution. Within the Rimworlds, plans were being drawn up for an ambitious scheme that would hopefully rid the Republic of its Star League enforcers for good. From a young age, Stefan Amaris had been taught to secretly loathe the Star League. The slight done to his predecessor, Gregory Amaris, during the Reunification War had never been forgiven by the ruling family. The First Consul had openly and frequently proclaimed public support for the League, and yet in his time of need, had been left to rot within his estate on Apollo while dissidents kept him under siege for over 20 years. Stefan sought to even that score, and in the young First Lord Richard Cameron, he saw a means to achieving those ends. Amaris departed the Rimworlds and would not return for over 10 years. State-controlled Rimworlds media CEO Jericho Jacox suggested that Stefan had more affinity for Earth than he did his own Republic, but this was all part of the act. Taking a page from Gregory's playbook, outwardly Amaris was the Star League's most avid proponent, but in truth, he sought to be rid of it. In March 2753, he arrived on Terra and introduced himself to the First Lord. Richard found this strange man from the periphery intriguing, and when he was presented with a tome of medieval legends and stories, a gift carefully selected to appeal to his interests, the foundation of a strong future friendship was established. Richard Cameron, now ten years old, was above all else, lonely. Both his parents were dead, he had no children his own age to socialise with, his supposed guardian Kerensky was never at court, the council lords used him or ignored him as needed, and his staff and retainers treated him coolly. It's perhaps no wonder that Amaris was so easily able to worm his way into Richard's circle of trust. The sad reality was that those around him were glad to be free from the responsibility of entertaining the tempestuous child, and so it was that Stefan became a father figure of sorts to the boy over the next two years. At his urging, Richard Cameron made a shocking debut appearance at the High Council session in October 2755. 
To honour his good friend's birthday, he first elevated Amaris to the position of Knight of the Star League, but then made the more surprising announcement that the SLDF would be withdrawn from the Rimworlds altogether on account of their interminable loyalty. The Council Lords assented, either through bemusement, confusion, or because they noticed that Alexander Kerensky was the first one who spoke against the move and so saw an opportunity to drive a wedge between him and Cameron, thereby further mitigating the Regent's power. In later years, Richard freely showered Amaris with gifts, even going so far as to construct him the Star Palace out in the Canadian Wilderlands. Kerensky continued to strenuously object to the so-called birthday proclamations for some time afterwards before he was finally forced to back down. 20th Army was borderline mutinous during these tense few years, but Kerensky gave strict orders to dismantle, destroy, or erase anything that might be used against the SLDF in the future. By 2757, they were moving for the border, the last divisions crossing over into the Lyran Commonwealth the following March. Unfortunately, across so many planets and facilities, the Rimworlds was able to collect a veritable treasure trove of information and military secrets. Two of the worst incidents involved Majors General Elliot Vaness of the Bonnie Prince Charlie Division, who failed to wipe the memory core of their Hevrol Aero Base, and Liam Garvey of the Pride of Cuba, who left most of Fort McHenry operationally intact. Both were relieved of command soon after. Incredibly, Amaris had achieved his goal of ridding his realm of the SLDF in just a handful of years. Buoyed by this victory, he remained on Earth, formulating new plans. Recognising his shortcomings as regent, one last attempt was made by Kerensky to mend the divide between himself and the First Lord. Alexander invited him to observe Operation Persuasive Force in the spring of 2757. This exercise, ostensibly a mock campaign to both attack and defend the Terran hegemony, was in truth a thinly veiled warning to the increasingly belligerent member states that he was prepared to take action against them. It demonstrated just that. First Army showed that the hegemony could likely be defended against an aggressor three times their own size. The operation was also useful training for the seemingly inevitable clash with the periphery. Unfortunately, while Richard Cameron was fascinated with the military manoeuvres, any hope of building a relationship was scuppered. Cameron had come aboard Kerensky's flagship, the SLS McKenna's Pride, with a contingent from the Rimworlds, who the commanding general had spent the entire exercise trying to separate from the First Lord, sending them off to various locations within the fleet, so that they might share a private word. Those individuals were all too happy to poke their noses around the fleet and watch the action unfold. When Alexander suggested that Amaris might not be a true friend, Richard immediately rejected the idea and withdrew further from his regent. Richard Cameron was a problem, just as the Camerons themselves were. They were a lever of power occupying the literal throne of Damocles. Occasionally, swords fell on them, and in their position, that was expected. That a Cameron heralded the end of Star League is no wonder. One began it, after all. I do not find blame in Richard Cameron for his position in the line of his dynasty or his age, or his inexperience. I do find issue, though, with his understanding of trust. He didn't learn one key lesson of rulership, in that those who agree with everything you think often will ask for something in return. By befriending an isolated Cameron, Amaris had little issue slowly enforcing a favorable status, and then a personal agenda. Richard Cameron's only sin was perhaps his foolish naivete and trust in what appeared to be a faithful ally as he had never learned that nations have no friends, only interests. The periphery by this point was a hotbed of civil unrest. Anti-Star League sentiment was at an all-time high, with much of this spurred on by state media. Director of the Torian Propaganda Division, Madison Ankafa, was one of the most recognizable faces within the Concordat and with Calderon's blessing, had whipped the populace into a near frenzy. Across the inner sphere, Jericho Jacox was doing the same. Jericho was carefully towing the line between the loyalty expressed by Amaris and the feelings of his common citizens. He directed his attacks not at the Star League itself, but at its leadership, the Cameron Line and the unruly council lords. The military-industrial complex within the territorial states was also ramping up during this time. This was happening with the tacit approval of the SLDF, who was relying on several suppliers to keep their periphery armies operational. One such venture was Lushan Industrials within the Outworlds Alliance. 
Daniel Lair's company, far from being technologically backward like the common outworld stereotype, had the most advanced laser manufacturing capabilities outside of the Terran hegemony, producing the new extended range and pulse lasers that otherwise were exclusive to the royal units within the SLDF. Freed from the same restrictions imposed by Directive 30, and with the High Council otherwise occupied looking at their inner sphere neighbours, the militaries of the periphery were slowly expanding. On the surface, they were not keeping pace with the member states for fear of attracting an SLDF response, but they were each secretly constructing hidden facilities within their own realm and beyond in the deep periphery. This was all the easier for the Rimworlds now that the SLDF had been withdrawn. Weapons manufacturers were receiving record profits all across the Star League, not just with the governments, but private concerns as well. However, it steadily became apparent that many of these purchases were happening through shell companies and the weapons, vehicles and mechs were disappearing out into the periphery. This meant little to those corporations producing the goods, but was a serious worry for the SLDF. The runaway military spending begun by Jonathan Cameron was something that his successor Simon was never able to reel in during his 13 years as First Lord. As the SLDF continued to grow in order to maintain the peace, it required an even greater arms industry to support it, which in turn only increased the proliferation of weapons among discontents. It was a deadly cycle that led to a destructive inevitability. Behind the scenes, Amaris was hard at work building an alliance between himself and the other associate members. At first they were distrustful, believing him to be nothing but a sycophant and lead catspaw, but when he promised them arms, even battle mechs, their mood soon shifted. While the Rimworlds was openly expanding their RWA to rival even the Innisfear powers, Amaris had also secretly begun building another force that by 2760 already numbered at two divisions. Tasked with the formation and training of this new secret army was one of the president's most trusted generals, Patrick Scoffins. Stefan had no shortage of sycophants, both in government and in the Rimworlds army, but in Scoffins he had a genuinely brilliant and loyal commander whose goals and beliefs aligned with his own. Patrick agreed that the Cameron family had done the periphery a great injustice and must in some way be made to pay. While Scoffins wasn't the first to be counted among Amaris's inner circle, he would become one of the elite five who were closest to the president. Most troubling for historians and those who wish to quickly characterize all those aligned with the Rimworlds as the villains of this chapter in human history, General Scoffins would show himself to be every bit as honest and principled as his counterpart in the SLDF. The secret army needed a source though, both of funding and material. With all legitimate efforts going into strengthening the RWA, Amaris needed a way to grow this force without drawing attention. He was the individual behind the shell companies placing those orders with the Innisfear arms manufacturers. Once in possession of the goods, he transferred them out to staging posts within the deep periphery to hide them from the Star League. This came at an enormous personal cost to the Amaris family's stockpiled fortunes, but it was one Stefan was happy to pay. Amaris had found willing partners with the leadership of the other territorial states. He promised the periphery realms complete access to those hidden stockpiles if they agreed to work together in a unified rebellion. The other realms did their part by recruiting a force of trained mech warriors, pilots and crews that would leave behind civilized space until the time was right. Though perhaps civilized space is a misnomer given what transpired in May 2760. The Bell Accords, signed during the Age of War, was a mutual agreement between the Capellan Confederation and the Federated Sons not to use nuclear weapons against each other, no matter the conflict. Though the Ares Conventions, which contained similar restrictions, had long since been rescinded, the Bell Accords still held. This meant little to the Chesterton Liberation Battalion, a paramilitary group who were able to procure and detonate just such a device on the planet Demeter. The history of the Chesterton dispute is one framed by absurdity. At one time, the capital of an early trading league, the Chesterton Worlds would go on to become a partner of the Tikhonov Union, a bygone rival to the Capellans and the Liao family. The ruling Tetrarchs fought a number of small wars with the neighboring Marlette Association over control of the planets. As time marched forward, those smaller nations were subsumed by the eventual successor states, passing on their ancient grudges. Since the founding of the Star League, the Capellans had argued bitterly over their claim to Chesterton, despite the reality that it was Federated Sun's territory decades before the Confederation even existed. Many would be forgiven for thinking that the so-called glory days of the League were a utopian era of human societal evolution and cooperation. This is certainly how the League would project themselves to the common citizen, 
but the truth was far more sobering. Hidden, petty conflicts would spark regularly, as ancient grudges simply didn't disappear because of the formation of the League. The Hidden Wars are proof of this, and one of the first major cracks of the League's so-called unity. This came at a time when the Confederation was transitioning between rulers, the young Barbara Liel taking office only four days before the attack. The Fed Sons immediately placed the blame at the door of the Capellan secret police, known as the Mashkarovka. Though Barbara vociferously denied such accusations, there was always a lingering doubt on both sides as to whether director Tai Young Guak was indeed the instigator. Regardless, First Prince John Davian took action, beginning a short and often overlooked border war between the two. It would grow to encompass a dozen worlds along three of the four combat regions within the Capellan March, but the main body of the fighting was within a 60 light year bubble around Redfield, where the primary Davian thrust took place. The 17th Avalon Hussars relocated from Robinson to Royalston in order to train troops ahead of the upcoming attack. This would be the first outing for John Davian's March Militia initiative, involving all four of the Capellan March units, with the Chesterton and Royalston Brigade seeing heavy combat. At the sore tip of Davian's thrust into the Confederation were the 17th and 22nd Avalon Hussars, leading the attack on Redfield, while a deep raid was launched against Way to keep the Capellans off balance. In 2761, another advance on Halloran 5 was repulsed by the Ariana Grenadiers Regiment of the Chesterton Regulars. To prevent the Federated Sons from launching a major invasion, the Chesterton Guardians Regiment of the Capellan Hussars conducted numerous raids against supply depots across the border. Chesterton itself, a point of contention going back over 400 years, would be the site of a Capellan counterattack. Their occupation of the planet was brief ultimately driven back by the Sirtis Fusiliers and a population that had no desire to join the Confederation, a nation of which they had never been a part. The following year, the Avalon Hussars succeeded in capturing Redfield. This was the first planet to change hands by force of arms since the War of Davian's succession. The SLDF in the region was kept hamstrung by the High Council, who gave orders not to intervene. 37th Corps Major General Simone Folk Smith refused to listen to the Council Lords and had to be removed from command over the incident. Kerensky, who was out in the deep wilderness of the Outwells Alliance at the time, was too far to enforce his own will on the matter. Ultimately though, all these hostilities would be forgotten overnight following the events at the next High Council session. Richard Cameron turned 18 on February 9th, 2762. For some time he had been theorising on how best to make his mark on the Star League once he came into power. He presented his idea to Kerensky, which would come to be known as Executive Order 156, a proposal that would more than halve the militaries of the member states and completely outlaw private armies. Kerensky cautioned against such an order, knowing that it would never be accepted by the Council. Egged on by Amaris, however, Richard went ahead with it, only to receive a terse invite to an emergency Council session later that month. When the state lords discovered that this was not some mistake or bad joke, they gave Richard Cameron such a dressing down that he was forced to withdraw his proposal. When he turned to Kerensky for support, he received none, only Amaris speaking in his favour. After this, the council lords went their separate ways and would not reconvene for almost 20 years. The emergency session of 2762 would transpire to be the last high council meeting before disaster gripped the inner sphere. Richard disbanded the council entirely after his rejection, and from then on ruled alone. His actions were unquestionably illegal, as outlined by the Star League Accords, and the various member and associate member states quickly took to ignoring his decrees. Unfortunately for the Star League and the Terran hegemony in particular, Cameron had precious little knowledge on how to run such a vast realm, and things quickly went sideways for him. His reputation across most of the Star League was one of a fool, but within the hegemony he was viewed as a genuine danger. In just a few short years, the economy was nosediving, and the quality of living was going down with it. Despised in his day as a childish and petulant ruler, history has not been kind to Richard Cameron even after his death. While he may have been an unwitting architect of the Star League's downfall, it's important to remember how many of his actions were orchestrated by Amaris, the puppet master who would destroy both Richard and the noble house to which he belonged. In the end, he was just another victim of the Periphery Lord's lust for power. Recent years had seen a change at the top step of government for several realms within the Star League. Besides Barbara Liao, 
In 2760, the Majesty of Canopus saw the rise of Janina Centrella, who reversed the decisions of her predecessor that had seen it become the one realm reducing the size of its military. With the support of Colonel John of Entha III, the Duke of Fanadir, she began her own expansion. That same year in the Lyran Commonwealth, General Kronensky lost one of his firmest supporters when Archon Michael Steiner II passed away. The two had been close friends from early in Alexander's career, Michael being somewhat of a mentor to him. This had, at the time, put Kerensky in the bad graces of Michael's son Robert, who viewed the up-and-coming SLDF officer as a rival for his father's attention. While the relationship wasn't overtly hostile, the commanding general would see precious little support from that quarter going forwards. Lastly, in 2763, Ewan Marek died and was replaced by his son Kenyon. While a great improvement for the Free Worlds and potentially for future international relations, this was a terrible shift for Alexander. The two had first met in 2756, when the young Marek served on the commanding general's staff. Kenyon's orders had seen a protest on Pollux brutally put down, earning him a stinging rebuke from Kerensky, and a wound to his pride from which Marek had never recovered. One event that went largely unnoticed around this time was the disappearance of one of the Star League's Expeditionary Brigade's detachments. This unit's mandate was to search out new habitable planets, others with easily exploitable natural resources, and even to search for any lost pockets of humanity that travelled into the distant reaches during the early exodus. However, in late 2763, they instead stumbled onto one of the Rimworld's supply caches and was immediately targeted for destruction by the forces in garrison. With the rest of the unit in the process of being disbanded due to the rising tensions, the SLDF missed what could have been a vital early warning. Richard Cameron, meanwhile, had his sights set on a prospective partner. Elise Graham had been one of the rare individuals in his young life that had seemed totally unintimidated by the supremely powerful First Lord, and was one of the few who told him no. In time, he became enamoured with her. Richard wasn't quite sure how to deal with this at first. He had already a reputation as a lech, but as his interest in Elise grew, those inclinations fell into the background. In early 2763, he found the solution. He proposed to Lady Graham, and remarkably, she said yes. The two were married within months. Cameron continued to fumble his way through government though. A desperate and ill-conceived attempt to redress the balance of power came when he passed the Taxation Edict of 2763, which once again saw the near-destitute periphery forced to pay substantial sums towards the SLDF so that it might maintain its advantage. Needless to say, this was extremely unpopular, and the territorial states openly refused, even the loyal Rimworld's Republic. The other member states during this time were content to sit back and let the First Lord dig himself further into a hole. In the Magistracy, the ruling Centrellas used their fortunes to begin hiring mercenaries from June 6, 2764, as they had done during the build-up to the Reunification War. Other periphery groups were privately funding the growing number of territorial state independence movements within the Inner Sphere itself. The largest of these was the Periphery Liberation Movement, who had been steadily growing in numbers over the last decade. By and large, the demonstrations put on by the PLM had remained peaceful, but in 2764, a sudden spike of 300 bombings across the Star League were attributed to them, despite their denials, and the SLDF came down hard. This, in turn, caused many of their members to respond with violence themselves, further escalating the situation. Periphery states had gone out of their way for a long time to be free of suggestions like control or hell, even taxes or tariffs. When invited to join the Star League, most of the Periphery flat out said no. The Star League, being the Star League, decided to have the Periphery regardless of what anyone there thought about it, as a unifying measure of strategic feel-good. Naturally, many people in the Periphery didn't like this and decided to do something about it. Terror attacks and asymmetrical warfare were only the beginning. Soon enough, they'd escalate to strategic weapons to remind people that Maslow's hierarchy of mutually assured defense is a doctrine to some people. 2764 was the final year of the pre-war crisis. The periphery was a powder keg that would take only the tiniest spark to ignite. The next year, Operation Torch would become that spark. For now though, Alexander Kerensky was stationed in the Torian Concordat, making preparations for what he knew would be a violent conflict. It would be an understatement to say he was surprised to welcome into his camp none other than Stefano Maris. The Rimworld's president came to him with information that he hoped would help ease relations between the two. 
Amaris reported that the Taurian Freedom Army, a terrorist group behind many anti-Star League attacks, was headquartered on the world Kamadier. Kerensky was both stunned and mistrusting, but his own military intelligence was soon able to verify the information. The 114th Pursuit Squadron was dispatched along with the 509th Battle Regiment and attendant mechanized infantry units. Spearheading the attack was the Special Armed Services. The raid was a tremendous success for the SLDF, and not just because they had eliminated the terror cell. Within the compounds, they found proof tying the group to some of the most senior elements within the Concordat, including Taurian Defense Force Comptroller Ernest Klein, all but proving their complicity in the attacks. A growing problem developed within the SLDF, who saw firsthand the effects of the depredations of the Council Lords and mismanagement of the Cameron Line. History would cast Amaris and Kerensky as two of its great rivals. In all of this, there seemed to be a moment where some believe the two may have even aligned together, and this is both a fascinating and terrifying prospect to consider. Before Amaris and Kerensky parted ways, Alexander spoke up. He declared that while thankful for the information the president had provided, he believed that Amaris was a bad influence on Richard Cameron, and cautioned him to back off. In response, Stefan declared that he was returning not to the hegemony, but home to the Rimworlds, and would not be back on Terra again for some time. But on his return voyage, he made one final stop at the court of the Star League to visit the First Lord. He reported on the seriousness of things on the front, and concluded that before long, the SLDF might need to move all of its reserves to the periphery. On the 21st of July, 2764, Amaris and Cameron concluded between them a secret agreement, the Humanities Homeworld Defense Act, which said that if Richard was ever in need, he could call upon the Rimworld's army for his protection. And true to his prediction, within two years, the RWA would outnumber the SLDF and the hegemony by more than two to one. Thank you so much for watching guys, it has been an absolute thrill to put this together and quite a journey to reach this point, but we are only just getting started. This is just chapter 1 of 9, so there is a long way to go. If you are interested in more content, this is just the latest installment in a long running lore and history series I've got, and I'm also going to be putting out a behind the scenes discussion video where I talk over some of the decisions I made, maybe some of the stuff that had to be cut, and some discussion on certain points in the video. You can watch that behind the scenes video for free at the Patreon link in the description, where you can also find regular updates on the upcoming videos. I want to offer a sincere thank you to everyone who collaborated with me on this one. They have volunteered their time to help make this a better video for you, and uh, I would really appreciate it if you could show them some love. Every one of them is a channel that I've enjoyed watching over the years, so I can heartily recommend each and every one of them. It was always my intention to end the video this way, but Madcat included a little extra at the end of his contribution, so I'll let him say the final word here. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Hi, this is Madcat529. I just want to thank Sven for putting this awesome collaboration together between myself and other fantastic Battletech lore specialists. There is so much incredible content out there for this universe with equally incredible people working hard to bring it to you. All I ask is to check out every creator featured in this video and support the other creators so stuff like this can continue being made. Thanks again, and have a great day.